He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. America, Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Well, I have to reveal something, America. Many of you are not going to like this. But yesterday at a private ceremony, just three people attending, me, myself, and I, We have very strict rules at Fatties United. We give honorary membership or just straight out membership based on people who are fat. Now, I'm not fat. I would say I'm a little husky. But nonetheless, I appointed myself the executive director, CEO Founder and Chairman of Fatties United, or FU. And as we look around the globe, we look around the country to add additional members. Well, yesterday we saw one, Mr. Producer. Chairman Xi of Communist China. Looks to be about 40 pounds overweight, by my estimation. It's a fat guy. And uh, so now G, Chris Christie, who else, Mr. Producer? I can't remember everybody. We have a whole number of people. Bill Barr, I believe. I think we're going to have Randy Weingarten added as a uh, as an honorary member, but I don't want to. I don't want to excite too many of you too quickly. So Xi is now an honorary member of FU, or Fatties United. Uh, he's our first, I must confess, international member. He's our first communist member. But FU, I think he's deserving of FU, don't you, Mr. Producer? So I wanted to make that announcement up front. FU... And G go together perfectly. You know, I try to bring to you these great pieces I I come across as I do my research or somehow get over the transom. And um, I found a particularly poignant one in the new criterion. And... um, Let's see here. It's on academic anti-Semitism, tenured barbarians. You really need to hear this out. It's been many years, they write, since we have had occasion to mention Rashid Khalidi. Does that sound familiar to you folks? Khalidi? Enthusiast for the Palestinian cause, bosom buddy of Barack Obama, 
and the Edward Sayed Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University in this space. Back in June 2005, in a column called Faculty Follies, we quoted Khalidi's thundering dismissal of what he called, quote, the utterly spurious assumption that universities are strongholds of radical and liberal beliefs, unquote. As if to underscore the malign fatuousness of that declaration. The infamous Professor Khalidi has just put his name to an open letter, signed by more than a hundred of his Columbia colleagues, calling on the university to defend those students who publicly support Hamas. And by the way, Khalidi, one of Barack Milhouse, Obama's closest friends and associates as he was starting his political career, buddies. Remember the LA Times has a tape of Obama speaking to Khalidi and others? And they still haven't released it. In any way, they don't need to release it. We know of the association. Calling on the university to defend those students who publicly support Hamas. The terrorist organization that controls the Gaza Strip and that, without warning, slaughtered more than 1,200 people, mostly civilians in southern Israel, on October 7. Now, that massacre also left 5,000 injured and saw more than 200 people, including infants, toddlers, and the elderly kidnapped and dragged back to Gaza Strip, killed more Jews than any event since the Holocaust, as you know. Khalidi, Khalidi and his colleagues are incensed that the names and likeness of some of these pro-Palestinian student protesters, that is, pro-Hamas student protesters, have been posted under the rubric, quote, Columbia's leading anti-Semites, unquote. So these professors write in their letter, as scholars, they write without irony, who are committed to robust inquiry about the most challenging matters of our time, we feel compelled to respond to those who label our students anti-Semitic if they express empathy for the lives and dignity of Palestinians and or if they signed onto a student written statement that situated the military action begun on October 7th within the larger context of the occupation of Palestine by Israel. Nobody was occupying the Gaza Strip. Israelis gave it to the Palestinians. But facts are funny things. And so they write, where does one start? We're tempted to begin with the question of whether anyone anywhere has objected to people expressing empathy for the lives and dignities and dignity of Palestinians. But let's leave that trope along with the needling as scholars gambit to one side for a moment and concentrate on two phrases. Military action begun on October 7th and the larger context of the occupation of Palestine by Israel. In the modern world, a military action is understood to be an action undertaken to achieve a specific military objective. And employing only those means that are in accordance with the recognized rules of combat. High up on the list of those rules is concern for non-combatants. It's an unfortunate fact that civilians are often killed in military action, but they must not be explicitly targeted. Nor may may they be deliberately mistreated. You know, like decapitating them, raping them and shooting them in the back of the head, dismembering them, sticking them in ovens, you know, stuff like that. In this sense, what Hamas started on October 7 was not a military action, it was a slaughter undertaken to foment terror. Civilians were not collateral victims of the operation. They, They were deliberately targeted for rape, torture, kidnapping, and murder. The vast majority of the victims were civilians, not military personnel. It's also worth noting the video evidence that in some instances, so-called civilian Gazans seem to have participated in the atrocities. And that's a fact that I have been meaning to mention. Contrast the behavior of Hamas with the behavior of the Israeli Defense Forces responding to the massacre. For weeks after the attack, the IDF urged civilians to evacuate to the south of Gaza, away from the headquarters of Hamas, which was certain to be the center of Israel's operations. Close to a million Gazans did evacuate. More tried to do so, but were prevented by Hamas, which confiscated their car keys and gasoline and destroyed humanitarian corridors that Israel had constructed to aid evacuation. And by the way, 
They also killed people who were trying to leave. Hamas, in direct flouting of the Geneva Conventions. And by the way, the reason they're terrorists is because they don't care about the rules of war, Geneva Conventions, the death of citizens. Hence, they're terrorists. Has always used civilians as human shields. And in this instance, the more than 200 hostages it took from Israel, part of that shield. Who knows where they might be secreted. As I said the other day, my great fear is that many of them have been executed. And they found a woman, 65-year-old Israeli, Ms. Weiss. Been taken hostage. They found her on the side of the street. She'd been murdered. But by far the largest component of human bargaining chips have been ordinary Gazans. Hamas, again in violation of the Geneva Conventions, places military assets and command centers within adjacent to and underneath schools, mosques, hospitals, and residential buildings. Not only does this ensure collateral damage to life and property, it also transforms those non-military sites into military targets. It is further worth noting that not only does Hamas exaggerate the extent of its civilian casualties, it also, as many video clips have confirmed, displays fake deaths and injuries. The corpses they have here, quote-unquote, that suddenly arise and walk are their gruesomely injured actor who is later seen cavorting on the street make for inadvertently amusing viewing, writes the new Criterion. The same perfidy is true of Hamas's cynical exploitation of sacrosanct symbols of protected assets. Ambulances have large red crosses painted on them to signal their exemption from assault. But the exemption is enforced only so long as the vehicles are used for the purpose for which they were intended, the transportation of the sick and wounded. The IDF has presented video footage of Hamas operatives using ambulances essentially as taxes to get around the city with impunity. That has the effect of making all ambulances suspect and thus vulnerable and transforming ones that are identified as transporting military personnel into targets. And it goes on. Before leaving the phrase about military action, it's worth noting that Khalidi, Professor Khalidi, Barack Obama's buddy, and his colleagues write that the action by Hamas has only begun, quote unquote. That implies that it's ongoing. As we write, the Israelis have made rapid progress against Hamas. The quick inroads made by the IDF have led to loud demands from the White House to the streets of London and many other places beside. For quote-unquote a humanitarian pause, a ceasefire. But no such suspension should be contemplated against an enemy. It's begun, but not completed, its hostile actions. It's a surreal demand. A so-called humanitarian pause requested by an entity that just weeks ago undertook an ostentatiously anti-humanitarian rampage of such murderous ferocity and savageness. But let us now turn to the larger context of the occupation of Palestine by Israel, the phrase used in the letter by these professors, of which Khalidi and his colleagues speak. Pace the prevailing narrative. There is no occupation of Palestine by Israel. Really, to understand the political situation in that part of the world, one would have to go back to at least 1917, if not indeed to ancient times. But in 1917, the Balfour Declaration, contemplating the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, explicitly sought to create, quote, a national home for the Jewish people, unquote. And by the way, they are the indigenous people, but they're talking about at that time in modern times. Explicitly sought to create a national home for the Jewish people, which became an international commitment with the League of Nations, formally adopted in 1922. The goal was eventually accomplished in 1948 when the state of Israel was created, having been strengthened by a 1947 resolution adopted by two-thirds vote of the United Nations General Assembly. Can you imagine that happening today? The succeeding history is complex. Its chief feature has two aspects. One is the story of attack after attack by Arabs against Israel, beginning just hours after the nation was born. The other is the series of compromises, negotiations, and concessions by Israel, whose overriding desire has been peaceful coexistence. 
In the present instance, the relevant drama began in 2005 when Israel withdrew all of its citizens, all of their settlements, military outposts from the Gaza Strip. The following year, Hamas won power in a legislative election. The last such election in Gaza expelled other Palestinian groups and has ruled the area as a theocratic war party ever since. Some pro-Palestinian commentators say the Gaza Strip is a prison state. If so, as one observer put it, Hamas is the warden. Hamas is the warden. And so uh, it goes on, and I I wanted to read this to you, not only because it's correct, but this tie-in with Khalidi. And his tie-in with Obama, Obama's statement in recent times. Absolutely disgusting and appalling. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Have you seen the headlines lately? Third highest deficit in history. Digital dollar sparks uncertainty. We're living in an unpredictable world, but gold is still gold. It's weathered many storms. My gold gives me peace of mind. It's tangible. And I'm a firm believer in owning gold. My favorite gold company, Augusta Precious Metals. Why? Let me tell you something. They're top of the top. If you have an IRA or a 401k and you want to diversify with physical gold, you can learn about the benefits of a gold IRA from Augusta Precious Metals. They're outstanding. Get a free guide to gold IRAs from Augusta Precious Metals today. Text LEVIN, L-E-V-I-N, to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Again, LEVIN to 68592. Or visit AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Text data and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. You know, ladies and gentlemen, just a sidebar for a moment. We don't invite every candidate running for office on this program. I mean, when you see all the, the individuals originally who wanted the Republican nomination, it's just, it's just not interesting to me. But we've invited many. We've invited Chris Christie repeatedly, have we not, Mr. Producer? Many times. Open your microphone. We've invited him on a lot. More than half a dozen times? At least. We've invited Nikki Haley on the pro. We've given up. Is that not correct? Correct. You're the one in charge of reaching out to them, correct? Correct. We invited Tim Scott. He came on the program. Very nice man, as a matter of fact. Forget about the presidential races. We've invited Jamie Raskin on this program. I don't know. A a lot of times. Has he come on the program? Has he or not? Is he offered? Nope. No. Liz Cheney. She come on the program? Nope. No. Bernie Sanders. Have we asked him? No. We've asked him, but he won't come on. Mitt Romney. We've asked him, but he won't come on. I want to again offer the invitation to every one of those people. Well, Tim's not running anymore, but all the others. I'll be right back. Have you seen the headlines lately? Third highest deficit in history. Digital dollar sparks uncertainty. We're living in an unpredictable world, but gold is still gold. It's weathered many storms. My gold gives me peace of mind. It's tangible. And I'm a firm believer in owning gold. My favorite gold company? Augusta Precious Metals. Why? Let me tell you something. They're top of the top. If you have an IRA or a 401k... If you want to diversify with physical gold, you can learn about the benefits of a gold IRA from Augusta Precious Metals. They're outstanding. Get a free guide to gold IRAs from Augusta Precious Metals today. Text LEVIN, L-E-V-I-N, to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N, to 68592. Again, LEVIN, to 68592. Or visit AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Text data and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions to get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. 
ever notice how you come across somebody once in a while that you shouldn't have messed with? That's Mark. And you can call him at 877-381-3811. I would love these other people to come on. To engage, to debate. So millions and millions of you can hear their views. And in many cases, me challenging their views. Now, if I agree with somebody, there's not a lot to challenge. But I think it's important that these people have access to you. We're very open about this. I mean, I can go through a whole list of people that we invite here who never want to show up. Some of them don't answer. Some of them do. Some of them blow us off. It just is what it is. And we move on. The show isn't really based on any of that anyway. Now, we know the name and the occupation of the individual who killed who killed Paul Kessler. Who's Paul Kessler? Well, you don't know his name very well uh, because the media have decided that he's not worthy of the kind of attention other people are who die unfortunately, at the hands of killers and so forth. But Paul Kessler's apparently not on the top of the list. But now we know, and National Review, among others, are reporting, who killed Paul Kessler. Leah Alnaji, L-O-A-Y-A-L-N-A-J-I, a computer science professor, I just read you a piece called Tenured Barbarians from the new Criterion. I did it for a reason. Professor at Ventura County Community College was arrested this morning, charged with involuntary manslaughter after he was involved in the deadly confrontation with pro-Israel demonstrator Paul Kessler. He died in early November of his wounds following a physical altercation with a counter-protester, quote-unquote, the Ventura County Sheriff's Department said in a statement afterward, and during that alteration, altercation, rather, Kessler fell backward, struck his head on the ground. The Ventura County Medical Examiner's Office determined the cause of death to be blunt force head injury and the manner of death homicide. At the time, writes National Review, the time of the incident, an unnamed suspect, since identified as al Naji was detained by police as law enforcement conducted a home search before releasing the suspect on his own accord. Ventura County Sheriff Jim Freihoff told reporters shortly after that Alnaji was cooperative with authorities, though police refrained from publicly disclosing his name until a more thorough investigation was concluded. Involuntary manslaughter, I guess it doesn't get any lower than that when it comes to murder. I don't know how it works in California under their code. But there you have it. I have a question for the media, all the media. How do you know these are pro-Palestine or pro-Palestinian demonstrations and not pro-Hamas demonstrations? You've lectured us over and over again that there's a distinction. Okay, let's stipulate there's a distinction. So why do you, why do you refer to or characterize People who are openly, loudly, vociferously, with posters in red and white and black and white, defending Hamas, filled with anti-Semitism, the swastika, demanding the elimination of the Jews. Why are you calling them pro-Palestinian pro, uh, uh, demonstrators? Why aren't you calling them pro-Hamas demonstrators? I'm quite serious about this. I just watched one of these demonstrations on TV. It was obviously a pro-Hamas demonstration. Uh, It was violent. And they called it a pro-Palestinian demonstration. Why? If they're right, and if I stipulate to it, just for the purpose of argument only. Aren't they making the opposite point? That all Palestinians are the same? 
Uh, is the point that all Palestinians are not Hamas or all Palestinians are Hamas? You see, they're sloppy. They're lazy. They're repetitive. They say one thing out of one side of their mouth and another thing out of the other side of their mouth. But I just saw this. I well, 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 wait a minute. What is this? So this California professor, obviously one of the tenured barbarians, is the new criterion, rightly put it. I love that phrase because it says so much. So much that is true. And I don't know if you heard about this. You had the biggest rally in American history, the biggest Jewish rally, and of course the biggest rally for Israel, in the history of that state, in the United States. And again, National Review, hundreds of pro-Israel demonstrators were left stranded on tarmac after the bus drivers coordinate an anti-Semitic strike. Really, what is this all about? Hundreds of Jewish Americans on their way to Tuesday's March for Israel to the National Mall were left stranded on the tarmac of a local airport after their bus drivers coordinated, quote, a mass sick out, unquote, to prevent the travelers from attending the rally. Around 300 to 900 passengers had flown in to Detroit or from Detroit were left on the tarmac, the Jewish Federation of Detroit, at Dulles International Airport for nearly 11 hours, causing them to miss the entire march. So here they are spending money to go to the march to exercise their free speech rights, their freedom to assemble rights, and they're prevented by truck drivers. Bus drivers, I should say. Who obviously are quite anti-Semitic. When several buses failed to appear upon their 10.30 a.m. landing, many travelers had no way to leave the tarmac. They're on the tarmac. David Kurzman, the senior director of community affairs for the Jewish Federation of Detroit, had learned from the bus company that this was caused by a deliberate and malicious walk-off, that is, of the drivers. He said the bus company told the Federation that a significant number of drivers called out sick when they learned what would be taking, where they'd be taking hundreds of Jewish Americans, that is, to the pro-Israel rally. The Federation has not named the bus company and has refused to do so. Jonathan Kaufman had flown in from Detroit, eager to attend the rally. He was one of hundreds left stranded. I thought it was nuts. I thought it was crazy that we're blocked from getting to the rally, he told the New York Post, adding that there were frantic calls to find out what was happening as they were stranded for hours. Our right to assembly is a constitutional right, and this was straight up blocking that. Those left behind spent roughly three hours on the tarmac. Before they were were loaded on several buses, only to be told that the buses were not for their group and they had to offload immediately. Now, the Jewish Federation of Detroit had chartered three private planes carrying 900 passengers in total. The transport rally goers from Detroit to Dulles, outside of Washington. According to airport regulations, travelers on privately chartered planes are not allowed to leave the tarmac without pre-organized vehicular transportation. There they are, stuck on the planes. Some for up to 11 hours. Because the passengers didn't pass through a TSA checkpoint before boarding, typical for privately chartered flights, they were not permitted inside the airport either. And when it came time for the whole group to fly back to Detroit after the rally, the plane's crew had timed out. That is, union rules. Exceeded federally mandated or federal government rules, federally mandated work limits because of the unexpected delay in the morning. The Federation was not allowed to leave for Detroit until 2.30 a.m. in the morning, leaving those who had made it to the rally waiting for hours outside the airport. Some in the group hadn't eaten all day. Kaufman, who spent hours on the tarmac, and spent hundreds of dollars to attend the march with his mother, called the walkout a deliberate anti-Semitic act that would have been called a hate crime if it happened to any other ethnic group. Can you imagine that? Isn't he right? Isn't he 100% right? 
this has received almost no attention in the corrupt corporate Democrat Party media. This is a historical moment, and I would have loved to be part of it. While we're deeply dismayed by this disgraceful action, our resolve to proudly stand in solidarity and so forth has never been greater. But there you have it. The radical left-wing Marxist Islamists are blocking traffic, who are attacking the DNC, I'll get to that later, and doing all kinds of miserable things. It's amazing. You don't hear about them being inconvenienced in any way, do you? No. They get on and off buses, no question about it, on and off trains, on and off planes. They seem to have easy access to wherever they want to go. We have a fantastic couple of shows this weekend, by the way. Sunday's Life, Liberty, and Levin, 8 p.m. Eastern. We begin with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And you know the way I conduct my interviews, people get to speak. You'll see what a remarkable individual he is, and he has some very profound things to say that you haven't heard everywhere else. And you'll see by the nature of my questions that I don't work for CNN. On Saturday, the night before, a fantastic interview as well. We have Stephen Miller, who was called by Joy Reid, a white nationalist and a racist and all the other things, and I wanted to give him an opportunity to respond, and he will. By the way, the guest after Netanyahu is Alan Dershowitz, and he has a lot to say, including about Obama. So it is a full weekend of spectacular programming, not because of me, but because of the guests and the nature of the format. Four guests only in two one-hour shows. And you'll hear things and learn things. You'll be intrigued by things that you may never have heard before. That's the point of the program. Life, Liberty, and Levin, Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. If you think you're going to be watching some college game or going out to dinner, you might want to DVR the program. While you're thinking about it now, Sunday, Benjamin Netanyahu and Alan Dershowitz. If you're not sure you're going to watch it, maybe you're going to watch football or something else, then set your DVR. Don't miss it. But even better yet, put aside an hour, just an hour, and watch it live. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. Have you seen the headlines lately? Third highest deficit in history. Digital dollar sparks uncertainty. We're living in an unpredictable world, but gold is still gold. It's weathered many storms. My gold gives me peace of mind. It's tangible. And I'm a firm believer in owning gold. My favorite gold company? Augusta Precious Metals. Why? Let me tell you something. They're top of the top. If you have an IRA or a 401k and you want to diversify with physical gold, you can learn about the benefits of a gold IRA from Augusta Precious Metals. They're outstanding. Get a free guide to gold IRAs from Augusta Precious Metals today. Text LEVIN, L-E-V-I-N, to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N, to 68592. Again, LEVIN, to 68592. Or visit AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Text data and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions to get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. So Joe Biden goes off script and he calls the dictator of communist China a dictator. The Secretary of State is sitting in the front row. And he has an even more grave and dire constipated look on his face than he normally does. He cringed. And of course, it is the subject of all kinds of media reporting. And yet Donald Trump is called Hitler. Despite his unprecedented, unmatched record in supporting Jews and Israel. By the media, he's called Hitler because he used the word vermin. 
So here is Xi, who's rounded up two, two and a half million Muslims, Uyghurs. They're being butchered, tortured, raped, forced abortions, slave labor. Re-education camps, I guess they might call them. But they cringe when he's called a dictator. When Trump's called Hitler, they're excited, they're happy. It's really perverse. Our media, very, very perverse. The one accurate thing that Joe Biden said, he said it. I don't know if he said it intentionally or just slipped through his dentures, but nonetheless, he said it. And that's sort of the least bad thing you can say about this genocidal maniac. That is G. Said he's a dictator. Wow. Now that'll do it. Now that's the end of all of our great relation. And what's the great relationship that he created with China now? We'll actually be able to talk to each other. Military to military. The last time we spoke military to military, you might remember the head of the Joint Chiefs, Milley, was warning the communist Chinese military about Donald Trump. Look, look. I'll give you a heads up if he presses the button. Don't worry. I'll let you know if we're going to war against you. So don't, don't get nervous. What a head of the Joint Chiefs. What a complete sleazeball. He was the head of the Joint Chiefs when we were leaving Afghanistan and surrendering. He didn't have the guts to resign. But she's a dictator. Oh my goodness. Don't say things like that. Only Trump. Putin, Mussolini, Stalin, Hitler. All those things. You heard him use the word vermin. Only Hitler's ever used the word vermin, and we know why he used it. Ask Liz Cheney, she'll tell you. And by the way, the Cheneys, they were never supportive of Israel either. Never. I'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. I bet you haven't heard this today. I-24 News out of Israel. Ready for this one? Survey finds majority in the West Bank, a.k.a. Judea and Samaria, support the October 7 massacre. Say what? Say what, Jake Tapper made it clear that there's two different viewpoints here. Hamas and the other Palestinians. Andrew Mitchell did. Virtually everyone on MSNBC has said so. Politicians keep saying so. Are they right? Are they right? The the Berzit University poll... Brzee University's Arab World for Research and Development, AWRAD, ALRAD, they did an opinion poll, revealed that a majority of surveyed Palestinians in Judea and Samaria support the October 7 massacre carried out by Hamas, and an even wider majority have a positive view of the various terrorist factions. Wow, and this is after the massacres. Asked on their view of various entities, respondents answered overwhelmingly in support of the military wings of the terrorist organizations. Now you know how Hamas got elected in Gaza. Palestinian Islamic Jihad, that is the Muslim Brotherhood, with 84% of the vote. Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades, these are uh, vile terrorists, got 80% of the vote. And Al Qasim brigades with the highest, 89%. Hamas got 76%. 
Hamas just is not subhuman enough. So here they are, these four terrorist factions. Palestinian Islamic Jihad was supported by 84% of the Palestinians in the so-called West Bank, that's Judea and Samaria. Al-Aqsa Martyr Brigades, 80%. Al-Qassam Brigades with the highest, 89%. Hamas, 76%. Political bodies, the press, and other countries were much less appreciated. The governing Palestinian Authority, only 10%. Though the ruling party, Fatah, had a slightly higher 23%. The UN received 9%. Russia was the most positively viewed country with 40%. Iran received 32%. Britain got 3%. We got zero. Right there with Israel. Now, we got zero. And we pour hundreds of millions of dollars into the Palestinian Authority. The PLO, actually. Hundreds of millions. So we're hated. We are hated by the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, a.k.a. the West Bank. So let's blame Israel. What do you say? That's Israel's fault. That's America's fault. No, it's not. Let's see. I'm just seeing here. 65% identified the war as being against all Palestinians. 98% said they will never forgive and never forget, quote unquote. Uh, 80% were more determined for a Palestinian state, but 90% said coexistence is increasingly impossible. So let's let's work that through. 90% said no to coexistence. It's It's not possible. 90%. So there can be no two-state solution. Obviously, you know, the Israelis in their own way tried to create one with Gaza Strip, and you see what they got. But as I say over and over and over again, and now leaders in Israel, even leaders in our own country, so-called, are using my phraseology. This isn't about statehood and a two-state solution. This is about caliphates. Hamas never intends to and never intended to be limited to the Gaza Strip. Iran has no intention of being limited to what used to be called Persia. None of these terrorist organizations and terrorist states have any intention of being satisfied with a sovereign country. The world is the empire they seek to rule. I'm not making this up. This is what they've said. It's just that I do my homework. So there can be no two-state solution. Gaza proved that. Their ideology proves that. They want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. It's not about two states, 10 states, 12 states. It's not about states at all. Arad surveyed 668 Palestinians and so forth. Their poll sample includes all socioeconomic groups. They said, they said, ensuring equal representation of adult men, women, and is, as they write, proportionally distributed across the West Bank and Gaza. So there's all the peace lovers. I just wanted to point that out. And so here's the problem. American foreign policy, such as it is, nobody can define it at this point. Let me put it to you this way. America spreading money all over the Middle East. We're spreading our money all over the Middle East in support of a fiction. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about this. In my opening statement on Saturday, I've written a lot of notes to myself and so forth. I don't think you're going to want to miss it on Fox, as a matter of fact. I think it's very, very important that we understand You might say, oh, here we go again in the Middle East. We're talking about potentially World War III. You see what's happening in our streets. The Middle East, yes. The Middle America, too. Now, you've seen by now police and protesters, according to AP, clash outside Democratic headquarters during demonstration over the Israel-Hamas war. 
This according to the Associated Press, which has done a horrific job. Typically in support of Hamas, typically against Israel. Police and protesters clashed outside the Democratic National Committee headquarters last night during a demonstration for a ceasefire in the war between Israel and Hamas, the latest reflection of boiling tensions over the bloody conflict. Now, let me slow down. You had groups that were there. One was founded by a Marxist. Others have been funded by the Hamas network. Some are front groups for the Soros network. So when they say tensions are boiling over, you saw or heard about or read about that march on Tuesday with nearly 300,000 peace-loving Americans. No clashes, no violence, nothing. In fact, for the media, it was so boring, they pushed it to the back pages. I told you about the New York Times, a picture that didn't even show the, the massive crowd, sewed some heads, you would think they're about 50, and go to page 21 or 26 or whatever, whatever it was for more information. This is front page news. Because this is the narrative. Look at this. Clashing. A division. Look at it. On the war between Israel and Hamas. Pro-Palestinian protesters. Wait a minute. How can you even say these things? That they say? Protesting the war between Israel and Hamas? So Palestinians are protesting what? Who is protesting what? Who are these people? They don't look into it. I look into it. Now listen to this. Scores of Democratic representatives and candidates, including House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, were inside the building for a campaign reception when it was interrupted by chanting outside. Protesters said they wanted to block entrances and exits to force politicians to encounter their candlelight vigil and their calls for an end to the fighting. Many of them wore black shirts saying, cease fire now. But the situation swiftly, uh, swiftly devolved. U.S. Capitol Police said about 150 people were illegally and violently protesting in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Washington, of course, protesters blame police for the violence, saying officers rush them without warning. It's, a shame, it's shameful the way the nonviolent protesters and members of our community were met with violence tonight, said Donny Nobel, the, who came from Philadelphia for the demonstration. Absolutely shameful. And they go on about what she has to say. Six officers were hurt. Six. A woman officer was punched in the face. Mostly peaceful protesting, I think. But look at the difference. You had the leadership, certainly the leader of the Democrat House, the leader of the Democrat Party in the House, in that building. These people rushed the building. They cut off the exits and entrances. That's pretty damn dangerous. When you watch the video and you don't need the interpretation by the associated depressed, you can see how violent these protesters were. Very violent. If a left-wing Democrat member of the House, Brad Sherman of California, he said the protesters were trying to break into the Democratic headquarters in a post on Twitter, X. Protesters deny that that was their intention. Oh, gee. We must all be Helen Keller now. No, we all saw it. And this protest was organized by groups, including, if not now, and Jewish Voice for Peace. Jewish Voice for Peace is a Marxist-led organization that supports Hamas. And it was founded by Marxists, including several self-hating Jews. Hence, Jewish Voice for Peace. But they're not alone. There are others. They're mapping out the country. They're organizing protests. Some of them very violent. They, they unleashed a siege against the Democrat National Committee. They knew Jeffries and other Democrats were in there. 
Now let's watch if the FBI tracks them down. So far, we haven't heard from the Attorney General of the United States for a long time. We haven't heard from the head of the Civil Rights Division, herself a bigot at the Department of Justice. We haven't heard from the Deputy Attorney General, the Svengali who actually runs the department, Lisa Monaco. We haven't heard from the head of the Criminal Division. We haven't heard from the U.S. Attorney in Washington, D.C. We haven't heard from anybody. No big press conference. We will hunt these people down. We will commit resources to this. We will look at video, facial identification. We're going to find these people who threatened to cut off the head of the Democrat Party. Nothing. Why is that? Because there's a narrative out there. Nothing can be like January 6th. Nothing can be like the extremist radical MAGA. And we got the head MAGA dog, man. We got him in our target sites. Yeah, one way or another. Whether it's in New York or whether it's in Atlanta or whether it's in Washington or whether it's in Florida. Man, we've thrown more charges against this guy. He's got to be convicted of something. We will take him out. We will stop him. In fact, we're going to get that scarlet letter on him. We have a number of judges who want to help us, like our judge in Washington, D.C. She's in our back pocket. We know where she stands. She's made it abundantly clear right there in court. Nothing. We cannot allow anything to change the narrative. Circle January 6th on your calendar. And no other dates. MAGA is anti-democracy. Not the Hamas network. Not the Soros front groups. Not these violent malcontents and miscreants. No, 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 no. MAGA. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. You want a killer Black Friday deal? I got one for you. Free Moto G 5G phone from Pure Talk. No gimmicks, no trading necessary. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, 15 gig data plan, just 35 bucks, and get the Moto G 5G phone free. But here's the deal. You need to move fast because these phones will be gone by the end of the month. So if your current phone is on life support, upgrade for free with Pure Talk. Enjoy two-day battery life, an exceptional quad pixel camera, and a whole lot more. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, L-E-V-I-N, to get this exclusive offer and to select the plan that's right for your family. Remember, Pure Talk gives you America's most dependable 5G network at half the price. So make the switch today. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin, that's slash L-E-V-I-N, to claim your free Moto G 5G phone with qualifying plan. Again, puretalk.com slash Levin, Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless. So Xi, who's a genocidal dictator, what he's done to Tibet, what he's done to the Uyghurs, what he's done to Christians, what he does to ordinary Chinese citizens who don't march lockstep behind his communist military, Xi, who's threatening war with Taiwan, who has stole our, stole our technology, who's spying on our various corporations, who's preparing for war. Not only does he get a wet kiss from Joe Biden, he was really in San Francisco to meet with the titans of business, a.k.a. the corporatists, the billionaire corporatists, or the executives. And as the Hill points out, he received a standing ovation as he took the stage to address a dinner with business executives at a summit of Indo-Pacific leaders in California. There's a big difference between most corporations today and most corporations 80 or so years ago. Most corporations in the past were patriotic. The executives were patriotic. Well, for that matter, so were Republican and Democrat administrations. So Xi meets with these 
heads of these corporations. Why? Because he needs them. His economy is in trouble. He doesn't want any decoupling. So he gives them BS, what they want to hear about. Can't we get along? Can't we work together? He tells them, we're in an era of challenges and changes. It's also an era of hope. The world needs China and the United States to work together for a better future. That's all they need to hear at AP and Reuters, CNN and MSNBC. That's all they need to hear on the great networks, the corporate media, after all. Wow, he's not what we thought he was. No, and the news corporations dare not ask to visit any of these internment slash death camps that they're running for the Muslims or anybody else who disagrees with the regime. I mean, he's blown out military leaders, foreign policy leaders, his own, his own appointees. He's blown out corporate leaders in China. Where are they? I don't know. I wonder. Those in attendance included Apple CEO Tim Cook, Blackstone CEO Stephen Schwarzman, Leaders from Pfizer, FedEx, Boeing, KKR, a big financial investment firm. Elon Musk was VIP of the reception. It's very unfortunate. And many more. And there they are standing up, giving a standing ovation to the head of the Communist Chinese Party. Did you ever think you'd love to see this? Ever? Well, here we are. We're living and we're seeing it. I'll be right back. You want a killer Black Friday deal? I got one for you. Free Moto G 5G phone from Pure Talk. No gimmicks, no trade-in necessary. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, 15 gig data plan, just 35 bucks, and get the Moto G 5G phone free. But here's the deal. You need to move fast because these phones will be gone by the end of the month. So if your current phone is on life support, upgrade for free with Pure Talk. Enjoy two-day battery life, an exceptional quad pixel camera, and a whole lot more. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, L-E-V-I-N, to get this exclusive offer and to select the plan that's right for your family. Remember, Pure Talk gives you America's most dependable 5G network at half the price. So make the switch today. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin, that's slash L-E-V-I-N, to claim your free Moto G 5G phone with qualifying plan. Again, puretalk.com slash Levin, Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless. Mark Levin, tough as hell. That's why I like Mark Levin. And I'm not sure a lot of people like him. He's tough as hell. But I like him. I love him. Call in now. 877-381-3811. We're going to have one of Donald Trump's great lawyers on the program in hour three. Isn't that correct, Mr. Producer? Involving the uh, the, the fraudulent civil fraud case, so-called, in New York. The filing for mistrial, there's an update on the gag order, a appellate judge threw out the gag order that the clownish elected Democrat judge had put in place, stating it's clearly unconstitutional, which it is, and I've talked about that gag order, and Chudkin's gag order, and all these gag orders, that these Democrat judges cannot wait to place on Donald Trump, as they continue to interfere in this election. And the Republican who was leading the uh, pack, when it hit this, and then we have other things to hit. From Hot Air, John Sexton. Some of those pro-Palestine, quote-unquote, protests are co-organized by a wealthy American Marxist living in China. And I am doing research on a lot of these media organizations and platforms, including some of the newer ones. You should see the connection to Chinese corporate front groups that they never tell you about. People have to find out. And the connections to this guy who was just convicted. You know, the cyber money billionaire. His fingerprints are everywhere throughout the media. It's amazing. If you were thinking that those large pro-Palestinian protests popping up everywhere seem awfully organized, you're not wrong. Today, the Free Press, one of the great news sites, Barry Weiss, 
points out that at least four rallies, including one in New York, which was later denounced as too extreme by even AOC, were organized by a group called the People's Forum. Whenever you hear something like the people's this or that, you know the commies are behind it. They love two words, people and reform, because they hate people and reform. Based in midtown Manhattan, the People's Forum calls itself a, quote, movement incubator. Oh, a movement incubator for working class and marginalized communities to build unity across historic lines of division at home and abroad. What a mouthful. But a review of public disclosure forms show that multimillionaire Navelle Roy, Navelle Roy Singham, S-I-N-G-H-A-M, and his wife Jody Evans have donated over $20.4 million to the People's Forum from 2017 to 2022 through a series of shell organizations and donor advisory groups accounting for nearly all the group's funding. Singham's wealth stems from ThoughtWorks, a software consulting company that he launched in 1993 in Chicago and sold in August 2017 to private equity firm Apex Partners for $785 million. At its multi-room modern headquarters in Midtown, New York, that is Manhattan, which anyone can visit, the People's Forum hosts classes like Lenin and the Path to Revolution, praising countries like China and Cuba that have, quote, smashed the shackles of Western imperialism, unquote, as well as seminars like Healthcare Under Siege and Apartheid, blaming Israel for discriminatory policies and genocide in Gaza. For now, the People's Forum is focusing on its pro-Palestinian agenda, calling for, quote, more marks, more marches, walkouts, sit-ins, other forms of direct action directed at the political offices, businesses, and workplaces that fund, invest, and collaborate with Israeli genocide and occupation, quote-unquote. The next pro- protest co-organized by the Forum called Shut It Down for Palestine is taking place November 17 in at least 18 locations across the world, including Copenhagen, New York City, Idaho, and Iowa. So these things are not spontaneous. You have these billionaire donors. You have the Hezbollah funding network. Excuse me, the Hamas funding network founded in the 1990s in a hotel in Philadelphia. You have the Soros front groups. And you have all these other entities involved in these truly horrible, violent protests that are taking place in our country, and the media fall for all of it. They regurgitate all of it. I don't know what it's going to take, uh, but uh, it's going to take something, maybe nothing, I guess, to actually wake people up. And along these lines, the Washington Free Beacon titled, he's a communist trust fund baby who inherited millions. Now he's using daddy's money to harass Jews. James Fergie Chambers wants to make Israel's supporters afraid to go out in the public, quote-unquote, writes Jessica Konstaku. Earlier this year, avowed communist James Fergie Chambers secured, quote, multi-hundreds of millions of dollars from his family, which controls the Cox Enterprise Empire, that is the media empire. Now he's using his inheritance to bankroll a far-left activist group that's harassing Jews across the country. Chambers, whose billionaire father, James Cox Chambers, co-owns the NBA's Atlanta Hawks, in July revealed that he cut ties with his family, securing a significant payout from Cox Enterprises in the process. There's always one of these punks in a family, I can tell you that. Months later, following Hamas's October 7 terrorist assault on Israel, Chambers began using that money to pay the legal fees for members of Palestine Action U.S., a radical group that has targeted Israeli businesses and other friends of, Jewish, of the Jewish state with vandalism and harassment. Those actions, Chambers says, are part of a broader effort to popularize coordinated attacks against Jews and their allies. We need to start making people who support Israel actually afraid to go out in public, he said in a Friday Instagram post. We need to make all of white America afraid that everything they have stolen is going to be burned to the ground. That's what makes them listen. 
Anti-Israel groups have long received financial backing from liberal mega donors. One of the America's loudest Hamas apologists, for example, is a subsidiary of left-wing dark money giant, the Tide Center. Still, Chambers' is spending and state admission reflect a troubling new era of fringe activism, one in which well-funded militant demonstrators are eager to break the law and, and uh, immune to the subsequent financial repercussions. Palestine Action U.S. members have in particular targeted Ilibit Systems, an Israeli defense company that provides the Jewish state with counterterrorism equipment. The group's members last month clashed with police outside of the company's Boston office. A demonstration that the group boasted, quote, completely halted Ilibit's business and led to multiple arrests. And within hours of the ordeal, Palestine Action U.S. members were back on the street, having been released from jail thanks to the Chamber's funding Palestine Action US which has referred to Israelis as genocidal maniacs and scum also targeted the Ilbiet office in Arlington Virginia where members of November 6 smeared red paint on the doors to the company's building and sprayed painted war criminals work here on the ground the group said its northern Virginia vandalism was part of a coordinated attack on Ilbit this company with members also targeting company offices in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. Chambers himself was arrested in early November for vandalizing a McDonald's restaurant near the White House after the company's Israeli branch donated free meals to the Jewish state soldiers. Washington, D.C. police confirmed McDonald's has been extremely patriotic. Walmart has been extremely patriotic. Fox has been extremely patriotic. Newsmax, OAN, same thing. Those demonstrations have already caught the attention of law enforcement officials who argue the Palestine Action U.S.'s militant tactics and Chambers' deep pocket could lead to serious violence. Two such officials told the L.A. Magazine that federal agencies have received intelligence that Palestine Action U.S. could threaten homeland security and heed calls for Hamas to carry out attacks in America. I'll tell you what, if we don't get our hands around as a country... These dark money billionaires like Soros, like this guy, Chambers, like that guy, the Marxist and communist China and so forth, are obviously trying to overthrow our society. We don't get our hands around the, the entities that have these American front groups with these fancy names that are, have these networks in America funding these, these protests, but not just protests, funding violence supporting terrorism, trying to mainstream terrorism in Hamas, destroying our colleges and universities. If we don't get our hands around this, we will cease to exist as a free, immoral country. Remember what I've said in the past. When people say, well, the vast majority of fill-in-the-blank aren't that way or don't believe that, that's not the point. It's not the vast majority. And I want to tell the FBI director who must listen to this program, there were only 19 hijackers that resulted in the largest murder of American citizens right here at home in American history. 9-11. 19. Didn't matter how everybody else felt. There were 19. Marxists, Islamists, fascists all understand this. Lenin wasn't leading a majority who wanted to overthrow a very horrendous, by the way, monarchy in Russia. But he did it. Mao wasn't leading a vast majority of the Chinese people for the communist revolution. Most people don't even know what a communist revolution was. Didn't matter. In Cuba, with the help of the New York Times, Castro had a handful of militia. Maybe 30, maybe 50 most. Yet he overthrew that government. Doesn't take many. But when you are backing from billionaires who are protected, protected by the media, it seems to me it's a lot easier. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin.
You want a killer Black Friday deal? I got one for you. Free Moto G 5G phone from Pure Talk. No gimmicks, no trade-in necessary. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, 15 gig data plan, just 35 bucks, and get the Moto G 5G phone free. But here's the deal. You need to move fast because these phones will be gone by the end of the month. So if your current phone is on life support, upgrade for free with Pure Talk. Enjoy two-day battery life, an exceptional quad pixel camera, and a whole lot more. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, L-E-V-I-N, to get this exclusive offer and to select the plan that's right for your family. Remember, Pure Talk gives you America's most dependable 5G network at half the price. So make the switch today. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin, that's slash L-E-V-I-N, to claim your free Moto G 5G phone with qualifying plan. Again, puretalk.com slash Levin, Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless. With a great hour three coming, we're going to talk in some detail about that case, the fraudulent so-called fraud case, update you on that in New York and several other things. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post. Deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811. 877-381-3811. I give you most nights and... Most often, more than one thought about what I think is happening in various aspects of our culture and country. Whether it's foreign policy or domestic policy. And I've jotted down some notes about what I was thinking about last night about the Democrat Party. Yes, the Democrat Party hates America. I wrote an entire book on it. But let me suggest something to you. The Democrat Party has been the breeding ground of anti-American hate for a long, long time. The Democrat Party thrives off of and strategizes around turning one group of Americans against another group of Americans. Stereotyping Americans based on wealth, based on age, based on genitalia based on race, based on anything they can think of. Because the more that we're at each other's throats, the more the Democrat Party seeks to exploit it. Fundamental transformation requires a revolution. It requires an angry people. It requires people who are hateful and jealous of each other. It requires an assault on our institutions, on our history. The destruction of actual education replaced with indoctrination. The Democrat Party's been behind all of this, really, since the founding of the Democrat Party, but especially now. It rejects capitalism for socialism. It rejects the civil society for Marxism. It rejects free speech for indoctrination. And at the beginning of my book, I explain in great detail how the Democrat Party is more like the authoritarian rule, rulers, excuse me, in the Communist Party in China and the fascistic elements of Russia. The problem is, America... No longer can the institution of the Democrat Party control what it's created. This is the new thought that I'm passing on to you. Even now, it tries to embrace these hideous movements, these violent movements, and their militia. But like all these other revolutions, 
whether in Russia, whether in China, whether in Cuba, whether the French Revolution, they eventually turn on each other. And they eventually destroy as much of the other individuals or entities based as possible until it is in control. That's what you're seeing taking place right now in our streets. The Democrat Party owns the colleges and universities in this country. It owns the professorships. The Democrat Party owns the government school system in this country. It owns the union that essentially runs those local schools. The Democrat Party owns the media, or vice versa, it doesn't much matter. And you can see how corrupt and destructive the media are and how they promote violence and hate, bigotry, racism, anti-Semitism. And they bring that into your homes every single day. Splash it in the headlines every single day. Just like the autocracies. They target people who they believe should be smeared. And they praise people who they want to promote. They create devils. And they create heroes. And now this institution, the Democrat Party is more and more being subjected to the various Marxist, Islamist, violent, racist, anti-Semitic, bigoted groups that it has helped fund, promote, celebrate, and it's starting to devour the institution of the Democrat Party. In the end, the Democrat Party has to make a decision. Does it fight them or does it lead them? Right now, it's not sure what to do. To lead them, they must embrace all aspects of them openly, in which case they'll lose most of the American people. So what they're trying now is to straddle, to straddle the fence. Joe Biden didn't go to that rally with 300,000 Israel supporting anti anti Semite ralliers because he didn't want to offend the pro Marxist and pro Islamist part of his base, the Democrat Party base. Newspapers, media websites, MSNBC and CNN, those particular cable networks, corporate media, most of the people who watch them, read them, are of the same mentality as the people you see on TV becoming increasingly violent. They hire individuals who support Hamas. Whether they be photographers in Gaza who praise Hitler, or whether they be Islamists who've come to the United States who've said things that are have been recorded, videoed, and they bring them on as hosts and guests. You can also see news personalities, journalists, who now have resorted to moral equivalency as a way of trying to defend themselves, defend their careers, because they don't have the guts to speak out and confront this. And most of them are Democrats, after all. That's what's taking place in our country, among many other things. And you can further hear it by the bellicose attacks the bellicose attacks by Joe Biden and his fellow Democrats against Republicans, conservatives, and mostly Donald Trump and his supporters. 
that he's Hitler, that he and they threat democracy, threaten democracy. You can see it in the rhinos who have no clue what's taking place. You can see it with Romney, McConnell, Haley, Christie, Sununu. You can see it with them too. Or they'll say they can, they try the right things to Republicans, dress up as conservatives, tell you they're all Reaganites, they're tough on China and all the rest. When you dig a little deeper, it's bullcrap. You can see it in our corporations. Corporations have been conquered from within. Disney is dying. Walt Disney's dream. An amusement park, a fantastic place for families, has been destroyed. Destroyed. You saw the video of some of the biggest executives with some of the biggest corporations in America giving a standing ovation to a genocidal mass murder. You wouldn't have seen that 50 years ago, 20 years ago. The Democrat Party is fundamentally changing America. It's fundamentally changing America in horrid, horrid ways. And it has unleashed forces that it cannot control. So it makes a decision. Do we get in front of the parade and join them? And overtly burning down the country? Do we stand up to them? I suspect the former. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. We're back, America. It is a pleasure to have with us Alina Habat. You know, Alina, I don't know. Have you been on this show before? I have not. I'm so excited to be on your show, Mark. I'm, I'm a big fan. And I'm a big fan of yours. You've been doing a fantastic job in and out of the courtroom, and I want to talk about that, what's going on in this fraudulent civil phony fraud case. First of all, tell America about this gag order and what happened today. I, I'm, it's a pleasure. Um, well, you know, there's this continuous unconstitutional attempt to gag the leading candidate for the Republican Party at the moment. And now this is the second time that a judge with political biases has been overturned and the gag order was stayed. They tried to tell us that we could not discuss his law clerk, who is incredibly politically motivated, as well as the judge and Miss James. Um, and in an attempt to, you know, basically stop us from telling the press what was actually going on, and they claim it was to protect her, even though she sits on the bench with them every day, um, we were gagged. And, you know, it's completely unconstitutional. We argued in front of the appellate division today in the first department, and they agreed with us. So the gag order mm-hmm. was stayed and lifted, and now I am free to speak to you, Mark. You're my first <laughs> show without a gag order. <laughs> yeah. well, they've mean, tried it with me, too, but not, but not through the courts, you know, just trying to boycott me. But now let me ask you a question. Of course. Yeah. To those of us who have practiced law for a while, particularly in the constitutional field, the unconstitutionality of these gag orders are so obvious and never before has a presidential candidate been gagged, let alone a former president been gagged, let alone in the middle of an election. They leak like hell to the media. They go out there and they talk to the media. The judge can say anything the judge wants to. And I'm finding this more and more with all these judges in these cases. They make political statements. They're asked to recuse themselves. They say no. The Department of Justice or the Attorney General's office in the case here in New York, they never shut the hell up. And then they want you to be quiet and Trump to be quiet. This really is, from my perspective, so obviously political, no? It's 100% political. In our case in particular, you have an AG who literally ran on Trump. She would not be attorney general. She would not be in that position. 
if she didn't promise her constituents time and time again at rallies, that was the theme of her rallies. Get Trump. When I'm in office, I'll get Trump. If you elect me, I'll get Trump. I will go into Trump organizations, financials. I will find something wrong with them and I will get him. So what more un-American behavior do you need than when we're politicizing our Justice Department, our AGs, our DAs, we've seen it time and time again, and then we're silencing their attorneys even. And by the way, just so you know, Mark, I was not even allowed to speak about the clerk on the record in the courtroom. So I couldn't even make a record for appeal. And I know, you know, a lot of your listeners are are not attorneys, and God bless them for making the right life choices. (laughs) But, (laughs) you know, to when you hire an attorney, they're your advocate. And to tell me as an advocate for President Trump or any of my clients that I cannot make the record I need to make about bias in the courtroom, and I can't put that on the record for the appellate division because we know this judge is going to rule against us. But let me at least get, have a fighting chance, you know, and I'll take it up to the Supreme Court if I have to. But how can I do that with no record? And mm-hmm. that's what's happened. And, and it's really unconstitutional. And we had a we had a good day today and, and got it stayed. And the mistrial is based on in part. And I read your fantastic documents and the mistrial is Thank based you. in part on how this judge conducted the trial, how um, you were guilty, obviously, before you even walked into the damn courtroom. Um, yeah. How he really was interfering with witness testimony, particularly the president's. Oh, you're going on too long and so forth, and you're not here to speak. And he makes these incredibly ridiculous comments and so forth. And so you've gone, you're going upstairs and you're saying, all right, look, this is a complete mistrial, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, let me, can I ask you another question? What about due process? This, in this courtroom, the idea of due process really uh, is outrageous the way this judge conducted himself. I'm even thinking of a federal right to due process, even though this is a state court action. Is that something anybody might think about down the road? We discussed it today, actually, in the appellate division. Um, This judge has, without warning to the president's attorneys, taken the president from sitting as a defendant in the courtroom next to his attorneys, put him on the stand, put him under oath, and asked him about comments he made to the press and then completely disregarded what his under oath testimony was and decided he just didn't believe him and then sanctioned him. That is not due process. Due process means you get a fair warning, a fair hearing, notice to your counsel, an opportunity to put your case on. That has not been happening. And more importantly, and I'm so happy that you're the show that I finally can discuss this in our mistrial papers, Mark, we outline the political contributions that this clerk has made time and time again in the thousands of dollars. There is a limit of $500. There is no exception to that limit. People in the press are are getting it wrong and saying, oh, she could do it because she was candidate for a judgeship, which she lost. That's incorrect. She was not at the time. And there is no exception. These groups that this clerk who has been in this judge's ear, has been contributing to, so you understand, are supportive of Letitia James and Mm -hmm. anti-Trump. One wrote an op-ed saying Letitia James is the last line of defense against Trump, and this is who she goes and protests. There are videos. She protests with them while the case was pending. The judge is putting out articles about Eric Trump, myself, and the president about this case, while the case is pending it is insane what i have seen it is insane and the american people can understand that when you are in the middle of a trial you are not allowed to do certain things and if you're the judge if you're the arbiter of facts and law you are not allowed to have any bias or appearance of bias and it's the it's the framework for our our country so that we feel that we have due process and there just is not that like you said, he found fraud before he heard an expert or a testimony, and this is effectively a damages trial. When we come back, I'd like to hold you over. When we come back, you know, when I was growing up as a lawyer, 
we had things like the appearance of a conflict. We had rules of professional conduct, depending on the state, rules of professional ethics. You're running for a prosecutorial position. You're not allowed to really campaign that you're going to target somebody. You could be sanctioned. You could be disbarred. I want to visit with you on that subject. We'll be right back. Mark Levin, the thunder on the right. Call in now, 877-381-3811. We're here with Alina Haba, who is a fantastic lawyer for Donald Trump. In, the, uh, in this particular case, in the phony civil case brought by Letitia James, the phony attorney general. Uh, so my question is, whatever happened to these rules of professional conduct in these codes for judges, for prosecutors, for lawyers generally? They're, they're never raised. And, you know, you don't have to raise it. Nobody has to raise it. If any lawyer sees this or a judge in particular, they are free to raise the question with the bar on their own, right? So so wh- why isn't the New York bar or anybody taking a look at any of this? You know, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. And that's a good point that you raise. And I, I don't know whether people don't understand that, but if what you're seeing concerns you, I encourage you to contact the bar because it is a problem. And there's accountability when you take the bar exam and you take the oath um, to be a lawyer in this state. And that is to apply law to fact. That is to abide by judicial code of conduct, ethical codes of conduct. And those rules apply to me and they apply to them. And, and this, what we have seen and, you know, the reporting, remember the reporting is only giving you a glimpse and that's by mostly left-wing reporters. Mm -hmm. If they're saying it's happening, imagine what's actually happening. So I encourage people to read the mistrial papers. You know, we outline specifically every action of what we have seen. It's very disturbing. And uh, and I think you raise a really good point. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be involved in this case to raise the issue. Where can people find those papers online? Where do they go? Uh, well, I, oh, you know, point, I can post them, you know. You absolutely can. They're public. And I encourage you to look at the links. Look at the links to videos of of people while this case is going on that are sitting on the bench, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not okay. It's okay. If you're a political person, a spokeswoman, an advocate, an attorney, it's not okay for a judge. It's not okay for a courtroom. Um, There is a difference between me and the judge. There is a difference between Miss James, frankly, and the judge and his law clerks, you know, so it's a, it's a really dangerous uh, precedent that's being set. I'm glad the appellate division saw our way today, but I, yeah, feel free to post it. I know there's been articles that have embedded them in there as well. Let's grab the, one of those, Mr. Producer, and flop it up there for everybody to see. It's very, very important. President Trump, his, uh, he's pretty amazing, isn't he? He is, he is steadfast. Bad, yeah. He's strong throughout it all. Most people would crumble. He doesn't crumble. He gets stronger, doesn't he? He really does. I think it motivates him because if your motivation is love of the country, I think that when you see the destruction that is happening to our country, it motivates you to get in there, fight. And he is fortunate enough to be able to do so in a very serious way. And I think his numbers show that people are listening and agree. So, you know, the more they hit him, he always says they're only doing it to me to get to you. You know, they want full control, and he's the only one stopping them at this moment. So, um, you know, it's important, and I know that that's why he's resilient, and that's why he's not afraid. Uh, Frankly, that's not why I'm not afraid. You know, I I really Mm -hmm. believe in what he's doing. I believe in this country, and I'm very, very scared by what I've seen in the courtrooms. When I say I'm Alina Haba and I represent Donald Trump, there is a sharp contrast between representing anybody else and representing him and the treatment he gets is so unfair and so wrong, Mark, that if you care about this country not going to hell, you know, you have to get behind it. Because I don't think anyone else is strong enough to, to fight the, the radical left, to be honest. Anytime you want to come on, let us know. Uh, it's no, been very nice yeah. to meet you. I've, I've been uh, admiring what you're doing from afar. It really is terrific. And. You're up against it. The system is very, uh, it's, it, the, look, I don't want to, I don't want to cause any trouble for you. So I'm saying this for myself. The system is corrupt. You have these one party cities, these one party states. And what's happening is it's reflected in the courtroom. 
And so when people lose faith in the rule of law, they lose faith in judges in the judicial system, and they see what's taking place, half the country at least, uh, they do grave, grave damage to this republic, even though they think they're helping their own party. And you're fighting against that. And anybody who does that deserves kudos. And I want to thank you very, very much for what you're doing. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. But I do it, frankly, for the country. You know, it's not about yeah. being Republican. I get it. Believe me. Alina Haba, thank you. God bless you. Be safe out there. Yeah, God bless you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care of yourself. First time I've ever spoken to her, ever. But look, uh, she has an impressive record. She fights. She doesn't back down. She could have. She wouldn't. And I want to talk about this gag order. And this is from uh, AP, which is a disaster, but I happen to have it in front of me. New York judge lifts gag order that barred Donald Trump from maligning court staff and fraud trial. See, even the way they do the title. It should be New York judge lifts gag order from lower court judge who violated the Constitution. That's the headline. A gag order that barred Donald Trump from commenting about court personnel after he disparaged a law clerk. A law clerk, by the way, who's been disparaging him. As Zelina Habah just pointed out, in his New York civil fraud trial was temporarily lifted today by an appellate judge who raised free speech concerns. How about all these phony legal analysts on CNN and MSNBC and everywhere else? How about all these phony legal analysts that said Donald Trump clearly violated this judge's gag order or that judge's gag order and they should send him to jail? Remember who said that? Joe Scarborough, Mr. Producer? Among other reprobates. Judge David Friedman of the state's intermediate appeals court. It's a weird system in New York. Their Supreme Court is the trial level. Then they have the first level, the intermediate appeals court, and then they have ultimately their appellate court, which is effectively their Supreme Court. Why, Mark? Well, somebody got drunk, that's why. Judge David Freeman of the state's intermediate appeals court issued what's known as a stay. Suspending the gag order, and by the way, there was a judicial nominee that Joe Biden flopped up there in the Senate and Senator John Kennedy, I love this guy, I can't get him on any of my shows, so I gave up. He asked her a simple question, what's the difference between a stay and an injunction? I, I really don't know. What? What? He asked these people the most basic questions and they don't even know the answer. Because Joe Biden is loading the courts with ideologues. And I might add, with the help of Mitt Romney and Lindsey Graham. Sorry, Lindsay. That's what you're doing. Um, the trial judge, Arthur Engeron, not to be confused with the Islamist dictator of Turkey, imposed a gag order on October 3 after Trump made a false comment about the judge's law clerk on social media. How do we know it was false? Then he fines Trump 15000 for violating and expanded it to his lawyers after they questioned the clerk's prominent role in the trial. What was happening is this clerk over and over again, kept, kept whispering to the judge, and the judge kept whispering to the clerk like they were on a date or something. But as I explained the other day, a lot of these judges are absolutely stupid and have almost no real litigation experience. Even more than that, they can't write or whatever, and they rely on their clerks to do the heavy lifting. And so at different odd stages of the so-called trial that's taking place where the result has already been decided before the trial um they kept whispering to each other and you can imagine you're sitting there as the so-called defendant your lawyers are saying what's going on there with the spectacle here so trump goes out and he slams away and he's like, you know what gag order and why don't we do it again and then he expands it to the lawyers fifteen thousand dollars that's unconstitutional america it amazes me. These legal analysts on cable, they will tell you there's a First Amendment right to go out on the streets and promote Hamas, a terrorist organization. There's a First Amendment right to whip up a crowd and talk about exterminating the Jews. There's a First Amendment right to carry a flag with a swastika 
and talk about the river to the sea. But there's not a First Amendment right, God forbid, if you criticize a judge or a prosecutor. He did what? Now that's the red line. You really crossed the red line there, fella. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something. When I first posted what this Trunkin did in Washington, D.C., and said that her gag order was so outrageous, it was without question unconstitutional. And by the way, such a gag order has never been applied this way in the course of a trial like this. All the Lilliputians, all the hemorrhotics, what's a hemorrhotic? I've explained this, haven't I, Mr. Producer? All the little human hemorrhoids, I call them hemorrhotics. All the hemorrhotics, ah, look at Mark, and then uh, some group did an article. Mark Levin's attack over and over again by lawyers and professionals online. Oh, okay, wow, I'm nervous. And they all are stupid, and unfortunately, they don't come back and say, you know what, you were right, we're... no, 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 they just keep at it. But I'm a big boy. So anyway... It is unconstitutional. Now a three-judge panel in Washington, D.C., which is very diverse. Very diverse, this panel. You got two Obama appointees and a Biden appointee. So I'm, I don't know what they're going to do, but Trump may have to appeal that to the wider court and then eventually appeal it to the Supreme Court. And he should fight these things every step of the way, motion after motion after motion. He is not required to bend over backwards to accommodate any judge's calendar. He's not required to bend over backwards to accommodate any prosecutor's calendar who have these ridiculous dates for these cases, which are ridiculous cases to begin with. All intended to harm his presidential efforts. All of them. We have an irrational judge yet who said, look, we're in the middle of a presidential election. He has the right to campaign for the primary, to campaign for the general. This issue of documents can wait. This issue of January 6th can wait. This issue of these phony arguments about the assessed value of properties, that can wait. These cases can all wait. But not if you're a Democrat prosecutor. None of them can wait because the purpose is to interfere with the election. And when they issued these gag orders, I told you, if that doesn't demonstrate the political nature of what's taking place here, nothing does. Because you're in the middle of a presidential election. And they want to shut you up so Chris Christie can go around and trash you. So Nikki Haley can go around and trash you. Even our friend Ron DeSantis, they can go around and trash you. Everybody can trash you based on the cases. I can't stomach it. So I speak out against this all the time. We'll be right back. Mark Levin. Folks, I'm telling you the truth. You definitely want to watch Saturday and Sunday, Life, Liberty, and Levin. My opening statement Saturday explains in great detail the Biden farm policy in a way that you've never heard before. I've given it a lot of thought, among other things. Of course, we have the great Stephen Miller. On Sunday, we have Israel's prime ministers, fantastic Benjamin Netanyahu, followed by a man who's become a good friend of mine, Alan Dershowitz. That is a killer one hour. I hope if you're not sure you're going to be able to watch, it's no secret, there's college football on Saturday night, there's professional football on Sunday night. By the way, a lousy game Sunday night. But go ahead and set your DVR. I think I think you're going to really uh you're going to really appreciate both of these shows. Uh, I think they're very very important. I'm not going to lie to you. I've been thinking about retirement or I was. But I can't retire now. There's just too much hell breaking loose all over the country. So the people who hate my guts and pray that I'll get hit by a car, it ain't going to work. At least for a few more years, it's not going to work. Just to show you how diabolical the Biden regime truly is, uh, as I prepare to leave the uh, to leave the air in just a minute or so, as I pull this up, listen to this: the indigenous peoples of Israel 
or in particular the people in Judea and Samaria, but not, not solely, not exclusively, but certainly them. And here's the Times of Israel. This is a breaking story right now. Blinken raises settler violence in call with Gantz. As Israeli Foreign Minister Cohen remains sidelined. In a call earlier today with Minister Benny Gantz, who of course was an opponent of Netanyahu's for Prime Minister, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken stressed the need for Israel to take affirmative steps, quote-unquote, to de-escalate tensions in the West Bank, including by confronting rising levels of settler extremist violence. What's happened, ladies and gentlemen, is terrorism has spread to and is rising in the so-called West Bank. And so people are defending themselves, including settlers. And so Blinken is saying, stop defending yourself. Doesn't, don't the Jews in Israel understand that we don't want them to win? Don't they get it? That's what Blinken's saying in, in his own diplomatic flim-flam. All right, folks, we, we salute all of our heroes. I want to thank you. God bless you for being in the audience. And I will see you tomorrow. Be well.